Now, I'm looking at propulsion as two types, the static type and the dynamic type. Mark McCandless was going through what I would call the static type, where it's more or less some sort of charge area, it charges kept there and it does its things. And I doubt if this is a craft that goes through space from one star to another, but more or less a scout vehicle. There is some rotating machinery in here, according to Mark. And you can see that what he did is he took a picture and it fits the description pretty much like this. So Mark does good work. In 1952, a man was sitting with his two kids at a baseball field and he took this picture above it. He didn't think anything of it, made no noise. And then four years later, he took a densitometer of it and he ends up with this ring or I'll call it a toroid. Now there's some other data that you see vortices on these vehicles. Now these vehicles cannot be spinning because they'll drive the guys crazy. So there must be some electric and magnetic fields that are inducing the vortices. And then Ed Walters shows some excellent pictures. Um, the reason I got involved with this was this blue beam. It's supposedly uh, stops human beings from doing anything. Their mind is working, but they can't move. And that's a hell of a weapon. And he's showing these pictures around his area and you start seeing toroids or rings. Now, obviously, if you look at this, this is a super superconductor uh, battery and a transformer and the guidance and control system. You can make any imagination you want, but that's a toroid. This is from another person on another type of UFO. So I'm saying that this is reminiscent and everybody seems to, these different species seem to know about this. Here's another toroid. A little bit clearer. <clears throat> What's going on? Well, is this an idea about Searle's experiment, Gooden and Roshan's experiment, or the Morningstar energy box? Andreessen was a, as an artist, and she is abducted daily. And somehow she says these beings allowed her to see it. And Paul Potter, who passed away in London, put these ideas together. And what you see here are four cylinders, not cylinders, spheres that are rotating. Here's an electric field out here. And somehow there's, there's a four mark short so that something happens with this field as well as what's going on in here with this. Now, when I first got involved with this, I remember reading something in Africa about a UFO crashing with aluminum, magnesium, and nickel. What would that be for? The nickels would be for magnetism. Would that be the spheres? The aluminum is electrical and magnetic. And the magnesium is electrical. Could there be a shell that's aluminum? And the other shell is magnesium. And what's the impact with the rest of these magnetic fields? And to throw it all in, Potter puts in microwaves and, well, metamaterials. So what's going on is that these guys, these species, really, really know their electrodynamics. And if you look at one system, one magnet, or one electrical field, it's not enough. There is clearly a coupling effect that exists between, well, let's say AC and DC currents. 
Can we learn anything about crop circles? Well, this one has uh, these patterns in all these three locations. And as you can see, somebody used it as a template. The comment is that people feel like uh, crop circles provide communications or a means of communications. And apparently we're not very good students at this. What you might find is that the crop circles like this, there is some asymmetry. And apparently that means something. But more importantly, when any of these things land, the grass is clockwise. And when you look underneath it, it's counterclockwise. That's, that's got something to do with the propulsion system. And then you start seeing these things, these crop circles. And well, that's what you would see with a wormhole. Now, I don't believe the wormhole is, hey, you go to the left field to 200 yards and blank, blank. What I'm thinking is that these crafts themselves make the wormhole. And then you see something like this. I got news for you. This is a Searle device. Wow. What a coincidence. Triangles again. Hmm. I'm significant or am I really insignificant? Let me make a diversion here. Tic Tac supposedly went underwater at 200 miles an hour. The fastest we can go is 60 to 80 knots on torpedoes. But if you go to supercapitating torpedoes, you can get up to 125 miles. What this does is it builds a, a nose that generates a bubble. It's not really water. It might even generate some gas to generate itself. And the drag goes down to zero, but you've got to push that thing to go. And you're talking about tens of thousands of pounds of thrust in a, in a small torpedo. They can only go straight if they go outside of the bubble and they touch the water. The dynamic pressure is so large that it crushes it. Now, if these things are going in there at 200 miles an hour and they're moving around underwater, the, the dynamic pressure is going to be phenomenal. And it's not clear how you can do this. And it, it's an enigma, another enigma in all this. And apparently this thing lost some part of it, but that's not my problem. Triangles. Well, gee, I want you to note that there's this hemispherical protuberance on these triangles. You can see it here. Now, if this is an advanced spacecraft. Gee, it's got these stringers on there. What's going on? This is from Bruce Cornett. And what he shows is that there's three bright spots and a smaller spot in the center. Bingo, you start seeing things like this. I don't believe it's the Aurora, but the point here is that these sphere constellation ideas, these rotating spheres are placed on four of them, possibly one for redundance and so on. Again, a hemispherical protuberance is something over here too. And then you start seeing these pictures in, from Belgium in 1990 and others were, my God, the plasma's all over the place. And for those that don't believe in UFOs, this is the UK from 59, from 69, 59, I'm sorry, to 95. And this is 700 observations that they've seen. 
and half of those are probably with triangles. So if they don't exist, all these people lied about all this. Now this is strange. It's about a mile in diameter and over, supposedly over London. There's obviously some stuff that you could see in a museum and not know what they are. And here's a piece of machinery that is believed to be 250,000 years old. Uh, this looks like a, a, a knee on a, a post on a cylinder over here, like a landing gear. Who knows? Your guess is as good as mine. But let's look at the other comment made about Einstein and Oppenheimer about Mars and the moon in 1947. They're finding out new, newer and strange things about structures on Mars. And we need to examine that closely. This was taken at by surveyor. Um, to tell you frankly, quite frankly, the other, uh, I give a full course on, on Mars and the moon by themselves. Um, Mars apparently is a junkyard for ET. There are pieces of scent dirt that it looks like a disc hit it and moved about 50 feet. Uh, buttons and even pottery. So it's, it's hard to see what's going on. Now, there are moon tubes and Mars tubes from lava. These are not small. You could put in cities in these tubes. So if you're in there, you're under a couple of feet of dirt and you could stop cosmic rays and you can make it. And that's part of the feelings that we have for uh, colonization, maybe go underground. What about the moon? Well, you can see right here, you would have never seen it. And somebody opened it up. This is the, the red mechanical head that was seen on the moon. And there's a lot of other stuff there. Again, like I said, it'd take an hour just to talk about that. Now, the Chinese want to go to the moon, and one of their motivations is they don't trust what NASA did or said was out there. And they're finding out structures. They found a pyramid. Um, it's, it's going to be forthcoming, and it's going to make you think twice. Okay, let's get back on the Earth. Notice that this is a nice, clean picture. There's no fuzz around it. Um, normally, I would argue that there is such electromagnetic field that you can never see what the body looks like. But apparently, this does. There's no cloud. It's near. It's quiescent. And it's keeping pace with the jetliner. Bruce Cornett was looking at situations where in his place in, in upstate New York, they were seeming to replicate airplanes. That's very interesting. And why would they do it? They would try to duplicate the noise as well. And it's an agenda that we don't understand. Now, this is from Bruce. I believe he feels this is probably a, a, a triangle. And, you know, these things are out there. We got to look at it and look for it. Okay, now, the rest involves some of the Tic Tac uh, UFO with the F-18 coming up there and the Navy seeing it. Basically, from what I can understand, you couldn't pick these things up with by radar or the IR. What made this unique was it came out from a UV sensor. And what it did was measure 
the ionization in the atmosphere. And that's why this stuff didn't come out for about four years <clears throat> because of the sensitivity of the sensor. Here's a picture of a UFO near an airliner. Notice it's not as clean as that one. I have no idea what this looks like. Whatever it is, it looks like it's transonic, about Mach 0.85 to Mach 1.1. And if it's a UFO, the, the point that these things do not have shocks, well, it's strange, it's an anomaly. All right, these crafts were out there doing their thing, uh, normal exercise, and they were given some vectoring response where very, very high radar power systems can identify them or something's going on and so on, and they found it. And this is what you see. And people looked at what's going on. Now, some of them are really fascinating. There are apparently three different vehicles. Uh, one is going at Mach 22 on the ground. In other words, if it was going a straight line, it would go into the orbit of the Earth. When fall short, it would go up into orbit. As I mentioned to you in the past, this 200 mile per hour investigation, uh, that, well, what, what, how do we do this? How can you do this? You know, you're going Mach 22, the heating would be tremendous. The pressures would be tremendous. We can't do that on the ground. We do it in the orbit because there's hardly any density up there. The density on the ground, on the air is heavy. You're gonna burn something out. Some more pictures that came out in this guy's presentation so on and so on. And then this notion that uh, Jack puts out there about metamaterials. Uh, I have to say that when you say you know how to make these things work, that bothers me. The question is that you've got different species and they all have different methodologies and they're going to do things differently. Okay. And uh, well, the, yeah, I, hear, I heard you, honey. Little administrative stuff here. Yes, my dear. And uh, the point here is that there are many ways of doing this. Uh, there are many static propulsion devices. There are very many uh, dynamic propulsion systems like I showed you before. And part of the problem is when you get a recording or not a recording, but uh, you're debriefing these people, you don't really know what to say. And what can they tell you about? For example, if I showed you a picture of a jet engine, I want you to tell me how does a jet engine work? If I take you a picture of an internal combustion engine, I want, I want to ask you, can you tell me what it looks like or how it works? You can't do that. So these unknowns will remain unknowns until we get to look at some of these crafts. And apparently this has been happening quite a bit. And there are some recent information about DIA and uh, uh, I know the individual that was involved and I think he made a mistake when he uh, put together a document by Eric Davis and Hal Putoff because he should have told them to tone down the technical comments and go for uh, what's the bottom line? What does all this mean? That wasn't there because those that report could have gone to people in the Pentagon and Congress and it may have allowed for additional funding to occur for those efforts. And basically, 
the issue here is you need to look at this to develop game-changing technology and create embryonic technology. Um, and George puts together, George, I'm sorry, Jack puts this together and, well, something's rotating. And so on and so on and so on. And from my perspective, it looks like somebody's trying to sell metal, metal materials. Um, I don't get a warm feeling about how to do it, but that could be my flaw and my ignorance. But my point is that show me an experiment. What are you going to do about it? And yeah, it's got good theory. Hey, you could eat up a lot of research doing this and end up with nothing and so on. And well, we covered a lot of ground here. Now, what are we gonna do about it? What's the bottom line in all this? <clears throat> you see anomalous behavior. Do you believe it? Do you look at it and find out that the evidence is truthful? Then you have to make a determination, and that is as honest scientists and engineers, you have to change the conventional wisdom into a new conventional wisdom that adopts the existing as well as includes the anomalies. When you go through efforts with just conventional wisdom, you don't learn anything. You learn something only with anomalies because it makes you think. And we need to come up with new theories and develop new technology and grow from there so that we can at least try to understand what's going on out there. And it's not, not out of curiosity, although that's initially the first case, but because of national security implications, as well as economic uh, standing. So let me leave this with the thought that uh, we've got to look at this, but we have to be careful what we're seeing and what we think about and where we're going to go and go from there. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, well, Paul, let me say thank you. Let me let me do this. I'm going to take you off. Let, let me oh. see. I'm going to stop your screen sharing. And uh, so before we go to Holy questions, everybody. shit, dude. Thanks. Hold on. Okay, before we go to questions, guys. <laughs> Somebody making fun of me? Give me a break. <laughs> No, he's he he had his mic on. So let me let me uh, everyone Paul thank you for an enormous presentation. So thank you everyone.